Hello and welcome to our talk this afternoon. Uh, my name is Christy Elaine and I'm going to introduce our event and then throw to Teresa who will introduce our speaker. Uh, I want to begin by saying that I'm coming to you from stolen holistically territories and I would ask since we are coming from uh, diverse places that we consider the colonial relations of power that structure the spaces that we live on, including our sporting spaces and our relationships to national identity and narratives that are so often accompanied and shaped by these colonial relations of power. So I wanna welcome you today to our speaker series, Men's Elite Level Hockey Culture, Context, Challenge and Change. Uh, our speaker series was conceptualized in the wake of the uh, sexual assault allegations against the 2018 World Junior Hockey Team and a general call in Canada and beyond to address what seems to be a, a particularly troubled culture of men's elite level hockey in Canada. The organizers of this event wanted to open up a forum to help us consider how we came to be in this place and what we can do to challenge and change narratives of masculinity as they're tied to hockey culture. And so it's in that spirit that we're here today. Our organizers are Cheryl McDonald, the director of the Scott McCain and Leslie McCain Center for Sport, Business and Health. Teresa Fowler, an assistant professor of education at Concordia University, Edmonton. Shannon Moore, an assistant professor of education at University of Manitoba. And myself, Christy Elaine, a professor of sociology at St. Thomas University. Our event is proudly sponsored by the Scott McCain and Les McCain Center for Sport, Business and Health and the Canada Research Chair in Physical Culture and Social Life. So thank you very much for being here today for this great talk and I look forward to hearing it. We'll let Shannon, or we'll let Teresa introduce our speaker today. Christy, so thank you all for joining us again for this series and I am very excited to introduce our guest today who is Daniel Alsarv, who is a certified upper secondary school teacher in Swedish and history and has a PhD in history with a postdoc in sports science. His research interests are mainly focused on issues related to sport, gender, violence, dem democracy, and power from the early 20th century onwards. His project, Ice Hockey and Change, Masculinity, Ideals, and Violence Norms in Swedish Hockey from 1965 up until today, was funded by the Swedish Research Council for Sports Science. Daniel is also a member of the project Education for Sustainable Sport Management, which seeks to develop a competence-oriented sport management program. So thank you so much for joining us, Daniel, and we'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for inviting me to to this uh, speaker series. Uh, yes, as uh, to, well, Shannon, Teresa, and Christy said, I am from Sweden. I therefore have Swedish as my mother tongue. So, uh, if there is any word or something that I don't pronounce right or uh, right, or if I might not be understandable please uh, write in the chat or raise your hands to to ask if, if there's any issues regarding that uh, and i uh, don't have a powerpoint to share so i will just talk uh, but i have some notes on my computer that i will uh, follow um yes so what um motivates me in my research and in my life in general is first of all uh, a political political reason or political uh, question i mean we live in a society where masculinity norms uh, seems to be quite narrow in many situations so some kind of democratical justice approach motivates me in my research and to try to broaden or make alternative or a broader rep repertoire of uh, different ways of being a man and a woman, of course, and, and several other genders that we have uh, possible. Also, since I'm a father of uh, uh, two children, 
I also want to leave this world uh, a little bit better than it was than I came to, to it. Uh, and a third reason that motivates me is that I really enjoy analyzing complex issues and also to write in general, both in Swedish and more and more in English, actually. Um, and I try to uh, write and publish in several different ways. I mean, both in articles, but also in uh, in yeah, sometimes in poems and sometimes in reports, reviews, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, we heard here the background to the speaker series, and in Sweden there has been well some sort of similar cases that uh, raised my interest in this topic regarding ice hockey, masculinity, ideals or norms, and violence. Um, well, the most uh, famous hockey-related example was when three players from the national team during a tournament um, was accused for uh, raping a woman in the hotel, in the players' hotel. So the three players, and uh, all of them had played in the NHL, um, admit that they had had sex with this woman in the hotel room. And by the time all players also were married, and uh, one of them had uh, children on his own, they admit that they had sex with a woman, and uh, but they weren't uh, like uh, sentenced for this action. A couple of years later, one of the players, uh, though, ha has been uh, sentenced for uh, intimate partner violence, I think it's called, yeah. Like, um, he, he, well, he has beaten his uh, wife. And he was uh, sentenced to uh, two and a half years in prison for this. I don't mention the names of the, the players here, but if you Google, you might find the names of them. Um, this is one type of violence that I'm interested in and that I find extremely problematic uh, in many ways. Another type of violence is the so-called peer violence or, or violence between men in the same team. And there has also been uh, some cases in Sweden that uh, uh, well expose this kind of hazing rituals between, between peers. And one of the biggest club in, in Swedish football uh, a couple of years ago, uh, well, it was a huge ex example in media. And um, yeah, the, the players there admitted that they had done this kind of rituals. It was with um, this thing that you are hanging clothes uh, in, your, in your wardrobe on. I don't know the, the word in English right now, but they put these things in uh, the newcomers anus and uh, I mean it, it they they were sentenced for for group rape the ones who did this and when they did it they they didn't know that they were like sexually uh, well violent to to a, a teammate they thought they thought it was fun they had been treated uh, like this their own when they were hazed uh, in in their in yeah, one year earlier. So it was a it was a cultural, funny thing they thought, but slowly they started to realize this, and uh, now the club has worked a lot with the culture, and uh, we don't know if it's totally changed or so, but um, at least these rituals are not there anymore. So this kind of things that uh, one could read about in the media raised my interest for yeah, putting focus on the ice hockey culture from a historical perspective, uh, since knowledge about the past makes us see the present in a somewhat different way or with, uh, well, with a historical consciousness. And I wanted to put focus on the masculinity ideals that this culture encouraged, but also to the eventual violent content or, or the status of violent in this culture. So I, uh, yeah, I, I wrote an application and was accepted for a postdoc project on this. 
uh, and I worked with this for uh, half time for four years. And the problem, I mean, research wise, um, or the background for this project and, and my, my research in general is that sports and ice hockey can be seen as health promoting arenas, but also with some an unhealth uh, promoting issues, so to say. So there's a complexity going on here in, in the sports culture. And team sports cultures in particular seems to uh, fertilize homophobia, sexism in, in a certain way. I mean, when young men, men come together in a group, there seems to be a certain ideals created that promotes toughness, courage, loyalty, obeyance, discipline, where different sorts of uh, weaknesses are ridiculed. Uh, yeah, and team sports that also allow or encourage hard physical contact, uh, men or young men uh, risk of being encouraged to be like violent on the pitch or on the ice. And some also seems to copy this kind of behavior off the ice or after the signal, after the end signal. Um, so violence seems to have like a masculinizing or uh, some kind of status uh, function in these sports. And it's not easily like uh, switched on and off for some players. Um, and I also found some more psychological research that, is, that um, explains that if aggressiveness is taught in an early age, I mean, when young children um, are encouraged to, to use aggressiveness as some kind of sporting, um, sporting winning way, uh, it seems to be more resistant and uh, trickier to change over time. And of course, if, if uh, young children are in this kind of cultures uh, during a long time of their, of their childhood and up to their youth, it will be even harder to change. So in, individuals that are more likely to behave aggressively in a sport context are, well, they are also that after viewing aggressive acts by other research, the same. Uh, research argues. It's Sachs et al. from 2003, if anyone is interested in that. Uh, I also added some kind of gender theoretical perspective with, uh, well, mostly inspiration from Raven Connell that sports in general can be seen as a symbol uh, or, or um, that, well, since sport is so separated uh, gender-wise, and, and uh, privileging men in so many different ways. It can be seen as a symbol and also a, a legitimizes the patriarchal power structure in society. So this is like the background for my interest and mo motives for, for this research. And one could say that I am like a yeah, critical or feminist. I'm interested in investigating this political dimension in, in sports. It's feminist, feminist driven, absolutely. But um, also, I mean, if we don't use these more political or normative words, I, I'm interested in understanding this, what is going on in this culture. And I'm really, I try to be as open as possible uh, regarding methods and, and uh, theoretical approaches to this. So I, I have, for instance, published my research in historical journals, but also in sport management journals, educational journals, sociological journals, and so on. So what I want to, well, show here a little bit for you is that I want to give you some examples of the representation of men and masculinity in Swedish ice hockey and place these masculinities in a slightly broader context and uh, 
focus a little bit on change and continuities of these men and masculinities. And then towards the end, shortly discuss this uh, using a social ecological prevention model. Sounds very fancy here, but I hope you can follow me here. So in 1969, it was argued in Sweden that ice hockey was a hard and uh, exciting sport. Never still, always exciting. A sport for guys with uh, powder, uh, gunpowder in the stick and a will that could move mountains. One could say, uh, this author argues, that ice hockey turn boys into men and men into boys. This means that the ice hockey sport is uh, without exception, the best method to foster youths. And what are, uh, what were these boys then fostered into? Yeah, one could see that during the sixties, Swedish ice hockey, there were a lot of scandals around it. I mean, it has started already with the world championships in 1949 where audience stormed the, the arena. And uh, this kind of, well, normalized, normalized way of, uh, well, using violence, both on the stands, but also on the ice, lived on for very, very long. Uh, so it, it was a lot of scandals with a lot of fights, a lot of deaths until the helmet was uh, made uh, mandatory in Swedish ice hockey. And uh, yeah, but but also, uh, which I also could see in the sources, also uh, uh, voices that argue that we should not be like uh, too negative to this culture. You should, you should like use or put on the ice hockey players uh, equipment for a couple of weeks before you like, uh, yeah, say anything about the culture. So there was the sort of gladiator hockey in Sweden at this time. It was uh, also a balance between some kind of destructive actions on the ice. The referees allowed quite a lot, um, but also um, it, the game was slower and everything. And uh, the it's interesting because the Ice Hockey Association uh, many, many times tried to defend the co culture and why the players sort of were so aggressive to each other. So there was a lot of uh, hookings and slashings and spearings and the referees couldn't see anything and the more a player was like receiving this the the shorter the the stubing was so and and when all these things were added then suddenly the the border is like uh, uh, well it's gone and then the player starts to use his fists instead and then, of course, the referee sees this. So they try to, in different ways, explain why players become aggressive and violent. Uh, and there was, well, only two referees at this point. So they couldn't really see all that was going on on the ice. I will come back to the rules and the referees and, and so on. I, I hope I remember this towards the end. But if one look at certain player ideals, uh, I want to use the example of Boya Salming, which I think you might have heard of even in, in uh, Canada. He played for the Toronto Maple Leafs for many, many years. And he was called the Undeadly, or BJ the King. He was uh, playing in the Olympics when he was 40 years old. And... Uh, he is a very interesting figure when it comes to masculinity. He is described as a very shy, uh, extremely loyal person that always focused on the positive, uh, the potential in things. Uh, but he was extremely uh, 
altru altruistic, I think altru altruistic, I think it's called. Yeah. He he really well. He could uh, lie down and uh, uh, cover a slap shot. There's one one very like story that continues that comes often back in the sources that he even though they had the lead against Poland with four goals and it was I think 42 seconds left or something he lied down and covered a slap shot with his body uh, so that kind of um, commitment Boya Salming was well he, he embodied that in a very extreme way and he also received a lot of um, yeah, injuries stitches which especially the media, but also magazines, you know, ice hockey loves to like uh, photograph and show. So he had his like skull sued uh, up nine times. Uh, I found this from 2014. He's broken his nose five times. Uh, he had his eye on the, on the right side, uh, only 50% of the of the vision left, mouth, tooth uh, was disappeared, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So there's a huge list only with his injuries, and it's a sort of, I don't know, romanticized way of looking at the the body of an ice hockey player in that sense. Um, another example, a bit more contemporary, but I I chose this because he. I think, yeah, you know him pretty well too. I think Peter Foschberg, who played uh, for the Colorado uh, a couple of years also for Quebec. He is described that he, he left Sweden as a youngster, uh, or he came as he came to to uh, to the senior team as a youngster, but left as a man. So and and he is also um well made he he played a, in a very like tough way uh, but he was also very technical so he he uh, uh stepped into some kind of star status quite quickly and uh, he uh, once said that he wanted to well become as good as Mikkel Yelm uh, which is not uh, famous at all, but also shows that he he somehow embodied a shyness, or he didn't like look at himself as a big star, which I think is also typical for for the Swedish Swedishness in this, not to brag too much about your 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 own uh, skills and so on. But also regarding Foppa, there's a romanticized way of his scars and also his injuries, in the beginning at least. Towards the end of his career, the, the injury was really problematic, so he had to end his career too early, actually, due to a foot, foot um, problem. So the wounds, the pain, the scars, are somehow mas masculine capital or, or masculinizing for these ice hockey players. If you don't have... Uh, been injured any time you you're not considered as a real ice hockey player so it creates some kind of social status um, and those players that do not dare to step into situations where where pain could be a consequence they are regarded as um, unmanly uh, nail polish players and yeah, there are many other epithets for, for these kind of coward players. Whining players is also a popular, popular epithet. So this nurtures an ideal that you need to like over trump or ignore and also to stand the pain in a way that, well, to look at yourself as some kind of, it's not possible to for you to become uh, injured or wounded uh, so you, you are kind of well over your own body in that sense or or um, uh, outside your body you use your body in a very instrumental way 
but the fact that you also become injured shows that you at the same time as a player is very fragile uh, which I think shows the complexity of these masculinity ideals too. Another way, I mean, there's not only these kind of examples in the sources. There are also uh, articles about players being a good dad, uh, a good friend, um, and a, a, a certain word that I don't know how to translate, but it's, it's literally translated as whole rule, meaning that you are like some kind of a dream for your, for your mother-in-law. So there are players that also uh, embody these kind of ideals, far from these more like violent ideals. Uh, sympathetic, they are empathetic, they spread happiness around them, they take responsibilities as a, a dad or as a leader in, in, in the team. And they also see uh, other kinds of values in life and outside hockey fishing, for instance, or the family, or the children, or the wife, partners. Um, so the construction, which I know that Christy also have written about, the construction of ice hockey masculinities uh, is not like uh, one-sided. They are complex, sometimes contradictive, um, and they are set in a national or local structure, but also in some kind of internet, international structure where the NHL is some kind of hegemonic force. And the individuals, I mean, they it's not easy for these individuals to kind of choose what kind of ideals they want to embody. I mean, you, you have your, your skill and your, your pros as an ice hockey player, and you try to... Uh, uh, for, uh, make that kind of skills and, and powers grow as much as possible. And that kind of creates what kind of ideals you want to live up to. And of course, the coaches want to see you perform in a certain way. The audience want to see you perform in a certain way. And also the sponsors, the media expect certain behaviors out on the ice. So this meaning that, that the, the ability to uh, counteract or uh, put into question certain ideas for these individuals is very limited or conditioned. Therefore, one can discuss uh, regarding change of these kind of cultures where the responsibility lies. I mean, is it on the individuals? On one hand, yes. As individuals, we are always responsible for our actions. But uh, I also want to argue that the organizations and the associations also have, and the legal organizations also have a huge responsibility for, for yeah, making uh, certain ideals or alternative ideals possible. And the audience and, and the other powers or influentials that are mentioned. Uh, and, and regarding change, we also have these processes of medialization, commercialization, professionalization. And in Swedish hockey, it started to become more and more professionalized in the 1990s. And uh, interestingly, at that time, beginning of the 90s, 1990s, there are also initiatives that try to expand Expand the club's responsibility for this kind of fostering. And for instance, uh, the, the, the club where Peter Fosberg was fostered, Mudo, uh, they had uh, initiatives that targeted the players' spare time. They had to sign certain contracts that they should behave at discos. They should not smoke. I mean, the non-smoking generation. They should not drink alcohol, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so there are these kind of initiatives that, that started at that time. Also, when the ice hockey culture became, at least the elite level, became more and more professionalized. 
Mm. And this is, I mean, this is uh, some kind of change in how we want or what kind of ideals we want to foster the ice hockey players in. And these ideals are continued in certain CSR projects that we have today. Uh, I will continue also to give you one more example regarding change um, that I found in the 1990s. Um, insurance companies criticized the ice hockey sport for being the most uh, injured sport or the sport where most uh, participants became seriously injured in Sweden. So there were several players paralyzed um, yeah, for life uh, through ice hockey and they, they found it very problematic and they want that yeah they put uh, some kind of change pressure on the association you need to do something and the association itself saw that they they didn't like get as many youngsters into the sport uh, children left the sport in a like a increased amount so they gathered all the elite clubs the coaches, referee organizations, and um, this insurance company and the biggest sponsors. And they discussed how can we change the fact that so many players become injured in our sport. And then they started to discuss, like increase the level uh, of the referees educations, but also that the referees should be better at uh, uh, taking penalties for so-called uh, destructive behavior, slashings, hookings, uh, etc. that I mentioned that, that has, was very common in the 70s and 80s in Swedish hockey. Open eyes checkings, uh, checking from behind. All these things were yeah, game penalty uh, for, for these kind of actions. And uh, it was necessary, the association argued, that all involved here must realize this and like buy this kind of change. Otherwise, it will not work. So it's important that every referee has like a similar level uh, of, of refereeing. And this actually caused a huge change in Swedish hockey that I think we can still see today where there are no like open eyes uh, checks, no checks from behind are allowed, and there's also some kind of uh, yeah quicker ice hockey in that sense. And I mean, this change was also going on in, in Canada, as far as I know. So then the well, this also this example uh, shows that in order to change this culture, all involved levels must work in a similar way or have a, a similar goal. And this uh, kind of model, I first thought of as different arrows, like connecting to a bigger arrow. But then I found this prevention model called the social ecological model of sports related violence and prevention. I think Heise started to, to write about that, this in the early 80s, I think. But it connects the individual level with the interpersonal level, institutional level, community and policy levels, and how these like interconnect with each other. So what the individual can do is uh, somehow connected to the policy level. And uh, yeah, through this, I started to write an, an article uh, called Brothers, Bruises and the Will to Win. And I tried to find examples on the individual level where, for instance, the competitive logic kind of directs what, what is expected by the players out on the ice. And I also tried to connect this uh, actions and ideas to uh, yeah, a broad kind of uh, violence content. And I mean, Messner has also written about this, how the, the body uh, in sports as ice hockey is some kind, some, in some way transformed into a weapon 
that is used against others, but also resulting in pain and injuries, and sometimes death for themselves. And at an interpersonal level, how men's bonding in, uh, in the ice hockey teams also relates to violence, where I found examples of um, this kind of hazing rituals, where men are violent against other men in the same team, but also how men in group are violent, misogynistic, sexistic towards uh, women and others. And there's also this kind of organizational uh, violence or, or non-actions uh, that, like in a silent way, promotes this kind of culture. So this I wrote about and uh, could also argue that in order to change, all these different levels need to connect and understand a certain problem and try to change that problem. Um, yeah, I, well, and uh, I think, well, I, I also thought, but I see the time is uh, running up here. I also think these kind of examples could be found in more contemporary examples. I analyzed uh, Instagram profiles from uh, professional ice hockey players in, in SHL, the Swedish Ice Hockey League, where they, on one hand, embody this kind of uh, masculinity. What is new is that so-called metrosexual masculinity was also found and how certain ice hockey players in that sense is also objectified or turned into sexual objects. Uh, but as a contrast to that, I also found that they self-chosenly or um, independently chosen to portray themselves as sexual objects, uh, where I found three players for instance, lying naked together in the bed uh, and with an interesting text next to it. And of course, this kind of uh, images creates certain types of, of comments from both men and women uh, profiles. It also signals some kind of homosexual undertone uh, one could argue, at least, but since these players are doing this openly, and I think that is the case with this kind of group rape, hazing rituals, that to demonstrate that you are sort of able to be nude in front of your teammates without uh, being sexually turned on, it, it uh, shows this complexity where you, on one hand, are very close with your brothers uh, homosocially, but you there's a certain limit where, where this homosociality never turns into a homosexual uh, relation. Yeah, I think I don't I don't know, I don't have any good like wrapping up, but I will only end with uh, what I I don't know the Canadian structures for this, but the Swedish um, research, um, um, uh, well, the Swedish uh, agency for, for sports related research that you mentioned here in the beginning also gave me and a colleague the, the task to write about how sports, well, how the Swedish sports movement can be better in taking responsibility to prevent men's violence against women and violence in general. So this uh, I worked with last year together with a co colleague from uh, Criminology and it was published as a report. And this report is written in Swedish, but this has now started to circulate within the Swedish sports movement. So, uh, and it was released, I think, soon, it's a year ago. But it's interesting how, I mean, one SHL club, Swedish, like, professional club, 
has contacted us and invited us. So we were, it was Skellefteå up in the north of Sweden. We took a flight there and went there and met the, the board and discussed these things with them, presented the, the report. And they were, they are super eager to work with this uh, dimensions of the fostering of, of youth players in their organizations. There are other sports organizations that has contacted me and invited me to their, their club. There are also regions, communes, local uh, governments that has invited me to come and talk about this report. And then I always say that try to co-organize with uh, like a local profile sports club because I think um, they need to hear this, what, what the reports uh, contain. So I think, yeah, that is interesting and shows that some sports, some ice hockey clubs are very open to work with these issues while some are obviously not. Uh, and Unfortunately, I think the ones that are not open also are these that have the, the biggest problem, actually, the biggest problems. There's a huge silence culture regarding hazing, for instance. I know from my students that these kind of rituals are still going on. Um, and also from, from this, the, the players that I meet when I'm, when I'm out and talking about this. So I think there are still a lot that needs to be done within Swedish sports. And uh, yeah, I think, I don't, I don't have any discussion points, but it would be super interesting to hear, like what is the state of, or is this, are there any organizations that works with this type of violence prevention in Canadian sports? And uh, if so, how do they do it? The mentors in violence prevention model is, is very, like, quite spread here in Sweden. I've also tried to contact um, the organization Coaching Boys into Men. There's a website about this that I found very interesting. But uh, so far, I've not got any response from them. Uh, so... This is my focus now. I'm a following researcher in two projects uh, where one is about violence prevention in a community. And I want to continue my research on like using some kind of prevention models in order to yeah, change masculinity ideals, uh, open up and make the, the toxic cultures more aware about their toxicality. Thank you very much. I'm, if you have any questions, I'm very open for discussions and so on. Yes, yeah, should I take, now you take the charge now, Shem. Yeah, I think uh, Teresa is going to run the Q&A. So what we'll do at this point is just invite folks. Um, first off, a reminder that this is being recorded. So if you do not want to appear on camera or your voice to appear or, or be heard, you can put your question in the Q&A and Teresa or myself will read it out aloud for you. Um, if you're comfortable unmuting yourself or raising your hand, just recognize that it will be part of the uh, recording. So at this point, I'll invite people to put any questions in the Q&A or if Christy or Teresa wants to start with a question as well. I don't mind to start with a question. Thank you, Daniel. That was really interesting. And it's just such a pleasure to see you and hear you talk about your work. Um, you know, I think about your work, of course, reminds me of my colleague and friend, Tobias Starts work on Swedish masculinity and, and hockey as well. And what I wonder is, is that, you know, I think in Canada, we imagine that Swedish mm -hmm. national identity is actually quite distinct from Canadian national identity. And, and so to hear you 
like make all these par- some things that seem very parallel and some things that seem like not like Canadian hockey masculinity at all you know the good parent the like the loving mm-hmm. father things like this which is not I think not as tightly aligned with uh dominant Canadian hockey masculinity and I'm wondering you know because hockey in Canada is so intimately connected to a sense of national, a colonial sense of national identity. Um, and I'm talking about, you know, the hegemonic version of the game, the men's elite game. How does that map onto Sweden? You know, what are the unique features of Swedish masculinity that produce this particular, like similar set of problems, but I would mm-hmm. expect coming from kind of different national narratives. I'm just wondering if you could speak a little bit to that. You know, yeah. Tobias is talking about the PAL, you know, he he distinguishes between the pioneer, which is, you know, I think most Canadians kind of get that in terms of our dominant Canadian uh, men's hockey identity. But he talks about, uh, you know, Swedish hockey masculinity is the PAL, which also seems very different. Yes, I, well, the, I have not like focused on like the natural uh, dimension of the masculinity construction. I know that Tobias has written about that, so I needed to like find a different angle about that. Uh, but I think he is absolutely right that it's very important to be a good pal in the team and to be a fun, do all these practical jokes, uh, whatever you can find, and. Uh, I mean, also uh, to characterize this kind of law of Jante. I don't know. We it's like you, you should not brag. Like as a Swede, as a typical Swede, it's important to be shy. Think of yeah, Barry Salming, Ing Mastian, Mark. These kind of characters. Also, Poppa, I think, was very like humble and uh, didn't take any like space didn't create any scandals or so but uh, what i also find interesting is that uh, and that i i've written about in one article with emma johansson where we analyzed uh, the event match event and the introduction ceremony where they kind of used the local worker masculinity a lot so um, and we did this in the in the middle of sweden where where mining industry is is huge and was in the past so there was for instance one club that uh, filled the ice with smoke and when the players entered it it uh, they they lit a yellow light on it so it, and then they also combined it with uh, this kind of uh, making steel uh, old films so that it, it really the the yellow smoke really mimicked the iron uh, magma from, from the steel industry so i think this kind of yeah local original masculinity uh, i think that the local patriot patriotism in my context uh, express it but that kind of masculinity, I think one could find in many of, of the Swedish ice hockey clubs. And I mean, I haven't looked at the national team, but I think the humbleness to be a good pal, not not be a... I mean, Slatan Ibrahimovic is a football player. He was He had a huge e- ego, and he has been criticized a lot due to this traditional Swedishness. He he stands out. He also has a background from former Yugoslavia. So he, he is he is regarded as a problematic character in that sense. Is it's that interesting. A, it, it, yeah, I, I think it's interesting that, you know, I don't think humbleness is not part of the kind of Canadian hockey mystique, and yet we all roads kind of lead to the same. Uh, misogynistic patriarchal culture mm-hmm. and I I think for me it's a bit of, like you know I can you know this kind of white masculinity pioneering spirit thing I, I get there and I, I mean mm-hmm. it's partly because I've spent a lot of time thinking about that but this kind of humble good dad guy that also 
ends up, you know, being tied to cultures of gang rape and sexual violence and player to player sexual violence, I think is really, it's curious for me. This is, I think it's really interesting, you know, like in a troubling way, not in a like, yes. just, I don't know how we, <laughs> and I, I see Shannon nodding. I feel like I'm, I'm making some sense. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I, I think there is something here that, uh, that is not like easy to understand. I mean, Sweden is also often ranked as one of the most gender equal places yeah. on, globally. I mean, the World Economic Forum has this kind of ratings, but Sweden has also one of the highest uh, rates of uh, rape, like, uh, yeah, so, so, so men, I mean, and in that sense, it, it's it's a horrible place to be a woman, especially Sweden. So this is called the Nord Nordic paradox. And I mean, also for these, I mean, especially in one of the examples I mentioned, this sort of, uh, well, responsible taking player who was a dad was also the same player who uh, was involved in a group rape at, in, in a hotel room during a, national tournament so so it 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 shows how problematic complex we can be as men i think uh, but Thank also you. maybe the group the peer pressure somehow the group dynamic is also important to you and i mean um yeah men in group one one i think it was the chairperson in the shl club Kuleftio, in Kuleftio, he said that men in groups with alcohol is one of the worst thing there is, actually. And it, it, it well, it, there's some truth in that, I would say. So, uh, yeah. But also, I mean, uh, the the group, especially in ice hockey, you you can you can make friends for your life in the ice hockey team through that. So. It, it, there's always this kind of pros and cons thing. I saw that Mike raised their hands in the beginning. I did not. I was clapping for you. you did, oh, yeah, you were clapping. Okay. Here, here I am. An example and, of humbleness. <laughs> John here. Um, I, I forgot to let him know to register, so we wanted to get the metrics yeah. up, but uh, you know, it's a, <laughs> we make it a package deal. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, it uh, really super. Thanks for the talk, and um, probably have like a hundred things, but I'm gonna just cap myself uh, in the interest of everyone, and happy to continue a discussion. Um, I'm one of those people who avoided junior hockey because I didn't want to be around the drinking males. I didn't want to get targeted or hazed. Uh, I didn't want to fight. Um, so whatever, and I'm convinced to this day that. Had I, had I entered that space, it actually would have profoundly changed me and I wouldn't be 20 years, no drinking, hello, whatever. But um, yeah, I remember like in 2019, I was watching uh, Estonia World Championships. They were hosting third division and Alpo Suonin was giving a talk and he talked about the most coach coachable players and, he, and he, as a renowned Finnish coach, uh, said that, uh, you know, the, the, the Swedes were the most coachable players. And I mean, I think some from based on what I'm hearing is like, there's this dissonance that happens where it's like, hey, like Canadian hockey players are the best. They'll hold the door open for like older adults and whatever, or, or, or maybe like, you know, Swedish players are the most coachable and uh, have, you know, the way they're received, they were received in the NHL, especially in, in Salming's era, you know, versus now, I understand and see different angles. And, and I really think it's wonderful what you're doing because like it all boils down to like, if we, if the kids don't get the life lessons from the sport, they, they should be getting mm -hmm. junior college pro, whatever, then there's really no point because then it's just going to be like bad people. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I guess I'll just wrap it up by saying two of the best spaces of hockey I've ever been involved with in my life and probably the most impactful would be 
my first power skating school, uh, uh, Hockey Tech International Toronto, the former Czechoslovakian uh, Martin Maglay. And it was kind of this like Soviet style, like discipline, like shoot the puck on the boards while you're in line. Who wants to do push up? So it was discipline, but with the explanation and rationale of respect yourself, your teammates, the coaches in the game. Makes sense to me. The other one, and then I'll mute myself, uh, L'Ecole de Hockey de la Capitale, the summer hockey school in Quebec City, which was very international, probably because of the Rendezvous Quebec Pee Wee tournament history and legacy, that it was well supervised. We did different sports. We did fitness testing. Because of that supervision, there was no bullying. And there was a little tensions between the, the Quebecers and the Americans, more so than with me, the Ontarian, but whatever. It was safe and it was fun, but it was also high performance. I'd love to be in touch uh, uh, down the line. Uh, thanks again for the talk. Thank you. It's very interesting to hear that you actually quit hockey. I I, I usually don't talk about my, my own career, but I also quit hockey due to that. I mean, when... I, I remember the certain point. It was when I when I was offered a, a, a contract. Then I thought, well, now now I saw that I I had like the 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 skill that uh, could make me into a senior hockey player. But um, I said that well, I would think about it, and then I moved to Gothenburg and started philosophy instead. That was more fun. Yes, and I think there are many, many that has quitted ice hockey mm -hmm. too early due to a toxic culture, unfortunately. Yes. Uh, do either of my co-hosts have anything they'd like to say before we unfortunately have to wrap it up because recognizing time here? I just want to say thank you, Daniel, and thank you, Mike, for sharing your yes. story, and thank you for um, the folks for attending our series today. Yes, and and I would want to echo the thanks, and I would love at some point for all of us to continue the conversation. I know Teresa and I have done research on people that were resistant to hockey culture, but we did hear a lot about when people quit hockey and the reasons for quitting hockey, and I think that, Teresa, may need to be our next study is not the people that were resistant and stayed, but the people that quit and what was lost as a result of that. I wanted to, um, so yes, say thank you to Mike for that. Thank you to Christy for, for the questions. And obviously thank you to Daniel. I'm very excited to read your Instagram piece now. And as, as a social studies educator myself, I was so happy to hear you using the historical thinking concepts of continuity and change when you were uh, talking about your research. And at the end there, I think you gave us all a plea for maybe more philosophy <laughs> in hockey. Maybe that would be uh, one of our one of our steps to changing the culture. So thank you, everyone. <laughs>